Hi everybody, I'm David Hanna from Cornerstone Group. We're here in Leamington Spa to film episode 11 of Coffee and Property. But first, got to tell you about the new feature that we've got in Hello Magazine. Alongside Martin Lewis, we're both commenting about the availability of the new 100% mortgages. Are they a good idea or not? Have a click on the link below, read the article, let us know what you think. Look, look at your strategy. There's no point, like I say many times, having a Ferrari on the drive and not being able to afford the insurance. No, indeed. Well, these mm. days, the petrol. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Today we're joined by uh, Paul Stewart of Segmented Solutions, and we're going to be talking about coffee, and we're going to be talking about property, and naturally we're going to be talking pensions and the abolition of the lifetime allowance and what it means for people generally and the property industry. So, Paul, tell me about the abolition of the LTA, because it came as a bit of a shock. And first of all, what is an LTA? Right, OK. Well, the lifetime limit is uh, an imposed ceiling on the size of your pension fund. Uh, after which time punitive taxes are applied. So mm -hmm. if you're building up an investment portfolio inside your pension and you're a property entrepreneur, it doesn't take very long to end up with over a million pounds of equity inside your fund. And um, the lifetime limit would effectively apply a charge of 25% of everything above that when you reach your 75th birthday, as an example. So um, mm -hmm. the abolition was quite an interesting one because it was a political move based on uh, NHS doctors who are also hit by the lifetime limit, mm -hmm. which meant that just turning up to work, being a member of their pension scheme, meant that they'd have to pay punitive taxes, which meant they were paying to go to work rather than being paid to be there. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Because, I mean, for the benefit of uh, people who aren't familiar with pensions, we have this thing now called a defined contribution pension with a, li a limit on contributions. This is where the lifetime allowance comes from, doesn't it, of course? Um, there used to be a kind of pension which was called uh, defined benefit, which was the what was also known as final salary. What was what was really interesting was that defined benefit schemes were abolished for the vast majority of us, and I say the vast majority of us because the civil service retained it, didn't they? Yes, yes. And right around the time of the budget, I did a quick calculation, sort of you know based on a final salary for a senior civil servant, what size of defined contribution fund would you need to return the same pension? And it was shocking, because it was nearly mm. three million pounds. So the civil servants had a three times the pensions that the rest of us were allowed. Thankfully, that's, of course, now no longer the case, but it did seem to yeah. me slightly unfair. So what role can a, a pension play in tax planning exactly? Well, a pension is a very useful product because everything that's inside the pension is outside of your estate. It's um, not subject to inheritance tax. Uh, it's also an environment in which investment returns inside the pot are uh, free from tax. Um, and also putting money into the pension scheme gives you tax relief. And if you're running a business and you're a property entrepreneur, um, you've got the new higher rates of corporation tax. So everyone's now scrambling, thinking, right, I don't want to pay 25% corporation tax, I'll put some money into a pension. Mm -hmm. And with the ceiling removed, a lot of the property entrepreneurs are chomping at the bit saying, oh, mm -hmm. I can now do stuff and play inside my pension scheme in a tax-free environment without having to look over my shoulder at this million pound limit. Yeah, I know. I mean, what, what I found fascinating is is that the p pension, um, property into pension has been mm. a part of a growing business's tax advice well, for as long as I can remember. Have you transferred your property into your pension? Did you pay stamp duty? If so, you are eligible for a stamp duty refund from HMRC. Contact us today. Many people put their trading premises or their business premises into their SIP or their SAS if they happen to be a company. Um, with the caveat that, yes, you have this problem with the LTA, so you couldn't necessarily put too much of your business property in if you happen to own large numbers of sheds or factories or whatever. That's no longer mm. the case, of course. We can now literally no. bunk the lot in. And again, as you rightly say, you will get a, 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 an income or a corporation tax deduction. You get to pay that rent, which is a deduction from your corporation tax profits. You, you're probably going to be paying for all the repairs as the tenant, another deduction from the corporation tax profits. And all that rolls up inside this pension scheme for free. 
Now, one of the differences between SIP pensions and SAS pensions I'm aware of, but I think the audience will be interesting, is once you've got this pool of cash inside your SAS, you can actually lend it back to the company under certain circumstances, can't you? You can use yes. it as a working capital pool almost. Yes. How does that yeah. work? Right, you're allowed to lend back to your company 50% of the value of your pension scheme. Wow. So if you've got a £2 million pension scheme, you're allowed to lend £1 million back to your company. They have to have acceptable security. So the security would traditionally be uh, a commercial property. Uh, bad news if you've already got the, got the office or factory in there. Though. Well, yes, yeah. And uh, I know that there's a, a whole raft of uh, different people doing different things with regards to the security aspect on the loans. But mm -hmm. you can, of course, have a business that has an intrinsic value in terms of its trading value. So therefore, the shares in the business will have a value. Oh, so you can actually charge yeah. the shares in the business as you well? You can, as long as those shares don't have a value because it's got lots of residential property. Uh, so it has to be the trading value of a business. Yes, I mean, one yeah. of the things we haven't emphasised is when we're talking mm. property, it has to be commercial property. UK pensions, recognised pension schemes, are yeah. not allowed to hold interest in residential property. Yeah. Although I've seen people lobbying for the idea that maybe they should. Um, indeed, yeah. what we, I, mean, I, I can recall from recent experience mm. of, of properties that had got, I'll call it planning permission, or suddenly acquired permitted development right, to convert mm -hmm. to residential had to be moved out of the scheme very sharpish because yeah. if a if a brick is moved when the conversion yeah. of course that gives you non-qualifying mm -hmm. property and that gives you all kinds of problems for the scheme doesn't it yeah that gives the scheme a problem because it's uh, then a taxable object that's held within the pension scheme and you could be liable to 55 percent tax charge on the value of that asset ouch yes Yes, although, is, although to be fair, there are commercial investment structures that uh, people use within pensions. So, for example, if you were to go and buy um, units in a legal and general unit trust that happen to be a property-related unit trust, the Inland Revenue are not concerned whether legal and general have a couple of buy-to-lets in their portfolio. <laughs> um, so there are, there are various structures around that are allowed to trade in property professionally and they can hold residential as well as commercial. Now that's fascinating, I yeah. haven't appreciated that. What we have seen develop over the last 15, 20 years is people who genuinely have got a, a, a decent pension fund but not adequate, um, refer you back to remarks about nearly three million, um, to provide for their future have been investing in buy-to-let property outside their pension fund, the private mm -hmm. rental sector should yes. we call it. Given the abolition of the LTA, is involvement in the PRS still a good thing, do you think? Uh, it's a very difficult one because obviously we're not investment advisors, um, but if someone has an expertise in how to maximise the revenue from their residential property, for example HMOs or serviced accommodation, they might feel comfortable in that marketplace. Mm -hmm. And if there's a way of achieving that inside a tax favoured environment like a pension scheme, then all the better. Okay. So, again, because of mm. non-qualifying investments, presumably yeah. if I had a buy-to-let private rental company, residential, yeah. I wouldn't be allowed to lend to it out of my pension fund because it's a non-qualifying no. activity. Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly, because okay. you'd have to look at the value of the business and say, well, where does that come from? It comes from residential property. Okay. And you look at the property itself, you can't put a security charge on residential. Mm. It's interesting because... As, as we were discussing just before mm. we started the recording, um, just before the budget, we act, I was actually working with a company that moved a commercial property out of a SAS because they were mm. about to exceed the LTA or they could forecast that they exceed, were going to exceed the LTA. And I wonder what yeah. they think about that now. Um, they're probably going to think yeah. it's still a good decision, but it was interesting to mm. see the logic, um, which was that they sold it, um, free of SDLT by the way because um, as we all know that as between partnerships and mm -hmm. connected parties including companies or as between pension funds that function as partnerships and connected entities there is no SDLT um, but what was really interesting when that one was that they were selling it to get cash out of the trading business that would then allow them to invest in third party securities and also cross fund other companies mm -hmm. in inside the group but in a very tax efficient manner because one of the things we didn't say when we talked about taking a working capital loan back of course
course, is you get to pay the interest on the loan at market rates. And at the moment, yeah. actually, if you're a lender, pretty good turn on the money. Mm. And there's no income tax or corporation tax on that. It's fully deductible no. from your corporate profits. Again, uh, I'll call it softening the impact mm. of the increase in the corporation tax rate. I mean, I just really, I mean, we've entered this period of 12 months of really massive economic uncertainty, surging inflation. Interestingly, we don't seem to have seen the massive recession or the collapse in property prices that all the experts predict. No, they've been predicting property crashes every week for the last two years. And weirdly, yeah. it hasn't. Yes. Um, and I saw yeah. um, saw a piece in the press this morning that most of the major banks economists have now stuck their hands up and gone, sorry, lads, got it wrong. Yeah. Which was nice of them to admit it, because eight months ago they were like, you know, we're all doomed to, to, to quote Dad's army. What's your view? How, how do you think the rest of 2023 is going to play In out economically, generally? I think one of the biggest issues for people is um, uncertainty. Mm -hmm. um, they're not too sure what's happening with regards to energy prices. Uh, but because a domestic customers' prices are fixed almost six months in advance, they can look and see that actually the market is settling and uh, they're going to be moving into a phase of a little bit more certainty mm -hmm. in terms of energy prices. And then perhaps they'll feel more comfortable um, unleashing their cash and their wallet and going spending money again. Um, so it's going to be a gradual thing. We've also got on the flip side quite a number of people on fixed rate coming to an end, businesses particularly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know one business um, that I've been talking to, they're terrified because their fixed rate comes to an end at the end of June and they're not sure how they're going to continue trading solvently when they get their, their, their yeah. new prices. So mm. in the marketplace, you've got a lot of ups and downs in terms of emotions and it's going to be a bit of a roller coaster this year, I think. Yeah, I think yeah. to use the phrase, the, 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 we're still seeing the after effects of the storm of last year. There are still yeah. ripples and, yeah. and cross currents. Yeah. I mean, you know, we saw uh, the, the five year mm. residential fixed rate was falling below 4%, even though the yeah. Bank of England is talking about talking the short rate up to 4.5. Although, again, mm. I'm not so sure the yeah. numbers justify it, but that's me. Um, we're seeing a property market that hasn't collapsed. All right, it's on minimal mm. growth. It's flatlining, but we've still got seven months of the year to run. Yeah, yeah. Let's just see what happens. Mm. I mean, I, I think, you know, if anybody was going out to buy their own home today, I mean, what would your advice be as a matter of interest? That's a really difficult one. Um, <laughs> being, I, being that we're not you, investment you, you advisors. Didn't come in, you didn't come no, in here asking no, simple questions, no, did you? No, no. Um, um, well, if you need a home and you need somewhere to live and it suits your family, then it's it's down to affordability in terms of mm. well, if you've got a mortgage offer, um, you might need to tighten your belt and not go out and do the things that you mm. perhaps used to do. Um, but then yeah. in the past, people were jumping onto fixed rates because they were exceptionally low. Mm -hmm. uh, now the fixed and variable rates are so similar, you could almost hedge your bets and stick with a variable to ride it down. You could do. I mean, yeah. I was chatting to a young lad the other day and I said to him, because first time buyer, yeah. moaning that a first time yeah. buyer property was 385,000 in the East Midlands. I mean, I was just eye-wateringly high. Yeah. And he said, do you think I should go in? And I said, well, look, the, let, let's start with the key platform. Mm -hmm. If you had if you do buy it at 385, can you afford the mortgage repayment? And he said, well, yes, I can. I said, well, do you think you should fix for three years? You may end up paying more than you should, but at least you've got absolute predictability. You know what your monthly outgoings are. For young people mm. on a salary, I call it a fixed income in the sense of they don't earn super profits every year. Surely predictability mm. and stability is what we're all looking Peace for. Peace of mind. Absolutely. Yeah, you, you're paying peace of mind. And yeah, financially, you might look back after three yeah. years and say, it cost us an extra few quid, mm -hmm. but I'd pay the extra few quid to sleep at night with a yeah. family. I'm not so much of an optimist to believe that, that rates are going to collapse quickly. No. But I think they will mm. return to around 2 2.5% two mm. inside the next 18 months. But we don't know what else is going to happen. Yeah, and again, it's that balance between not knowing the future versus the security of fixing and knowing yeah. what you're doing. When you're you, when you're young, mm. as you, and we come back to this and mm. loop around the same thing. Predictability yeah. is what you need. Yeah. We've seen vital landlords because of government pressure mm. exiting the sector. What do you feel is going to happen in the private rental sector, both as regards 
landlord participation, but also uh, as regards availability of rental stock for those who need or want to rent. I think the rental stock problem is the biggest problem that I hear of, um, certainly in the Midlands area where I live. Mm -hmm. um, if the property comes up, there's 11 people that want the viewing mm -hmm. on the Monday morning at nine o'clock and it goes. Yeah, so this uh, is the, yeah. so it's an undersupply issue. It's a supply and demand thing, which is gonna be pushing up prices, which in turn will help the landlords because obviously if they're paying more tax or they're mm -hmm. uh, concerned about interest rates, well, they're getting more rent. So they kind of begin to balance each other out. It's a bit of a yeah. It's yeah. a bit of a. I mean, but the fundamental. I mean, I mm. I was talking to somebody the other day, and you know, the, the fundamental problem is we still mm. seem to have a massive, I'll call it undersupply, um, for UK property across all mm. potential users. I mean, owner occupiers, investors. Oh, know, absolutely, right? absolutely. Interestingly, though, the commercial sector has a lot of properties that are now available, and they're available for conversion to residential. That's interesting. So, so where are, where yeah. are the conversion? Where are the developers? Where are the converters? Well, I've, I've got a number of pension clients who are um, taking on board commercial property, converting them to serviced accommodation or mm. straightforward residential because, for example, the government are moving a department into their town. Right. So things like that are, you know, okay, well, bubbling, we'll, bubbling around in the background. We'll, we'll probably assume that's the northeast of England and leave it alone at that. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's yeah. enjoyed a massive bounce in prices. It's gone. Yeah. That's gone completely contrary to the market as a region. Yeah. Which, yeah. Is, I, as I said, it had to be because of a jobs increase. Because mm -hmm. that's, yeah, that's the only yeah. thing that can usually trigger these things. Mm. So, for the landlords who, of course, have I call it exited the market, mm. they didn't like. The three percent surcharge. They certainly didn't like not getting higher rate mortgage relief. No, they they no. chose not to incorporate, which I think is frankly a mistake. Mm. But that's me. You know, they've already, and we saw again a headline this morning: capital gains receipts have soared in the last twelve months. Presumably, yeah, because people of this. disposing of properties. Yeah. Uh, when is capital gains tax returned and paid these days? On a residential property. On sale. a residential property. Yeah. Within sixty days of. Uh, the completion of the property transaction. So it's a quick payment of tax, followed up by self-assessment to top and tail it to make sure you got the numbers right. Yeah, at the end of yeah. the tax year. Yeah. So it's not the old story of sell it, wait for the end of the tax oh, year. Oh no, no, the, the tax bill hits you pretty quick. So they've yeah. actually accelerated their own cash flow on that as well, which yes. is rather yeah. Yeah. interesting. So it, time used to be there was this, originally the proposal was if you were a non-resident, you paid and settled within 60 days. If you were a resident, you merely returned it. You didn't yeah. settle. They must have presumably have changed their minds on that, or is it? Oh yeah, it's it's a gov government policy to get the money in quicker. So the answer, mm. I mean, is is that particularly those of us yeah. who come from the, the deal with it in a yeah. year and a half time generation, if you're selling a residential property, you've only got two months to sort your capital gains out. So yeah. you really do mm. need to actually have it sorted out on the day of completion. Yeah, you need to know your numbers. And of course, a lot of people, they sell a property, then they start fishing around to say, well, what is my tax liability? Mm. Should what, be the other way around. What information it? do I need to gather <laughs> in order to work it out? And mm. it's, it's possible there are people who aren't working it out properly. They're forgetting that certain things mm. can be included. So um, if you rush quickly, to meet the government's deadline, you might be uh, tripping over and paying more than you should. And again, I mean, from a tax perspective, mm. I've, I've never quite figured this out because if you've got a property with a large latent gain, um, latent means embedded but not yeah. realised, why don't you incorporate the portfolio into a limited liability company? The gain gets locked in the shares. Mm -hmm. Property company acquires all those properties at market value, and then the one that you were thinking of selling, well, you sell almost as a no gain, no loss. Yeah, yeah. And that means that you've s essentially deferred the tax until you dispose of the shares, which you which may you, never you, do. You may never do. Maybe just you know pass down the generation on debt rather than yeah. being a capital gain. Uh, and of course, yeah. many people who aren't tax guys, we you know you and I are both mm. tax guys, would say, well, of course the gain gets washed out on debt. Mm. There is no gain, gains on debt but you worry about inheritance tax. But then you start to see this, uh, again, we've seen mm. some lobbying for it over the last few years. We're saying, well, maybe we should just Im abolish inheritance tax uh, because it's now the yeah. lowest yielding tax and it's the most complex to administer. Yeah. I think those of us who work mm. in stamp duty might not agree with that, but you know, it, generally speaking, mm. it, it's, it's a difficult tax. So in, it's obviously a factor 
And I, I, I don't necessarily think that people in the private rental sector do have a little bit of forward thinking and a little bit of forward planning. And mm. this is tax planning, it's just making sure that you don't pay it sooner than you have to. But I know somebody very, very close to me personally who got caught mm. out by the 60 day rule. She, she didn't realise and, and she ended up having to pay a penalty yeah. because she hadn't returned it. Thankfully, mm. the gain was minor, but this is, this is, is prior, you know, probably the area that people are most ignorant mm. about because that change seems to have crept in quite quietly. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, and if you're a busy landlord, it's not the sort of uh, thing that you bring to your own attention and deal with all the time. No, absolutely not. No. Uh, I mean, in terms of tax and pensions, I mean, mm. are there any changes, com- apart from the abolition of the LTA, are there any changes coming up there? Inside pensions? Mm. Not that I'm aware of. Okay. So there's no real mm. moves to tax them? And well, the thing is, if, if you look at it from a calculation standpoint, there's an element of money that you can take from your pension called the tax-free cash or p- mm. pension commencement lump sum. Right. And it used to be a straightforward percentage of your fund. Mm-hmm. Uh, but obviously with the lifetime limit being uh, abolished, the government has sneakily said, oh, the maximum tax-free cash or pension commencement lump sum will be 25% of the old lifetime limit. So, so we're still stuck with 250 ish Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you build up a multi, multiple million pound um, pension fund, because you're allowed to now, mm-hmm. you're still limited to the element that you can take tax-free at 268000 or whatever. Right. Which most of us would think would be a nice retirement bonus, and we're probably yeah. actually all investing for income anyway, because we want yeah. that security in retirement. So. Yes, yes. But it's amazing what people moan about. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, interestingly, yeah. talking of retirement, uh, when you hit a retirement age and you start to draw down the pension, are you required to liquidate the fund assets and go and buy an annuity, or can you self-fund your pension? No, you can self It depends on the type of pension, and obviously we deal with self-administered pensions and rather than SIPs, mm-hmm. so I'm, I'm talking purely from the self-administered um, side of the fence. Um, as long as the pension has got liquidity to pay the income, and that could be from rental income from a property. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're requiring an income and that is covered by the rent, then there's no issues with continuing that investment inside the pension scheme and then just effectively drawing the, the what was the rent as your pension income. Okay. So in terms of, and I, I think mm. I know the answer, but I'm going yeah. to ask you anyway, anybody who's an entrepreneur, got their own limited company or their own small trading group, SIP or SAS, which do you think is better? <clears throat> Bearing in mind the SIP community will probably be watching this. The SIP community <laughs> will be watching this. Te- technically, they are both pensions. Yep. Technically, they both receive the same tax reliefs. However, however, if you are a property entrepreneur and you're dealing with investments, if you have a multiple member SAS, it's an awful lot easier on the administration because it's one SAS owning one property. Mm. If you've got a collection of um, husband, wife, son and daughter that have all got SIPs, you can still buy the same property, but you've got different trustees potentially Mm. on land registry. And also in terms of potentially stamp duty issues, if you've got a SAS with multiple members, it's a lot easier to uh, sit down and get tax advice uh, in terms of moving the properties. Absolutely, and of course, as, as you rightly say, with multiple mm. trustees, you're going to have multiple administration charges on the same transaction, which yeah. is going yeah. to reduce the overall yeah. benefit to all of the SIPs involved. Yeah, and of course, one thing that I often come across is people saying that their SIP provider makes a charge because it's an FCA regulated structure, as opposed to a SAS, which is unregulated. The um, provider makes a charge based on the entire value that they hold. So if they hold a commercial property, Mm-hmm. and the professional SIP provider is literally doing nothing apart from sitting watching the rent coming in. Mm-hmm. They feel it's a little bit uh, disingenuous to be paying a, a fee based on the property, the asset value. The asset value. Mm-hmm. Whereas with a SAS, you pay a fee based on the administration that's done to look after the reporting rather yes. than as a percentage of the fund. Mm. Yes, I've got my own personal yeah. comments about SIP trustees, and I should probably keep them to myself at this stage. Yeah, but, so. yeah, yeah. I, I, I've got family members who've got property held in um, four SIPs, and they say when you add up the charges across the mm. board, it's at least three times what they would be paying if they had a SAS. And 
certain set trustees mm. even make you do all the work yourself anyway. But that's oh, of course can't possibly say anything. Couldn't other. possibly no. do a valuation and organise a lease. No, that's down to you, the member. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Even though you are the tenant, so yeah, yeah. That is, let's yeah. not go there. But certainly, entrepreneurs who are control freaks and they really want to run their own business and they are into the attention to detail and want to make all their decisions find it infuriating when they're not in control. Mm. And sometimes that frustration spills over into um, their SIP. It's not necessarily having a go at SIP providers, but it's the frustration from the, the animal that's. Wanting yes, to I think. I, I mean, you know, one of the. Well, I, Comparing SIPs and SASIs, I mean, mm. you say SASIs are unregulated, they're still obviously recognised pensions. Pension. Yes. Uh, but it's very much the the fund members that are in mm. control of the mm. trustee, because there's a trustee company generally, isn't there, and a professional trustee yeah. involved, or is that no longer it's required? Not, it's not required. Um, all would, of that. would you recommend it, however? Well, it, it's a difficult one because you have to have some pensions professional in the background mm -hmm. telling you what needs to be done, how to do it properly. So we, we act as practitioner. Right. Um, okay. And our clients are the scheme administrators, they are the trustees, they are the members. But they all come and say, Paul, we want to do this. Can we talk about it before we do it? What's, what's the issue? What's the paperwork? What's the rules? Um, and it's like being the conscience on their shoulder as opposed to being the trustee who holds assets on their behalf as well. Yeah. I mean, hence the, mm. hence the, hence the two terms, you know, small yeah. self-administered yes. scheme as against yeah. self-invested. Yes. Although I would argue yeah. some SIP providers' rules mm. means it's nowhere near self-invested because you, you, some of them you just yeah. don't get given very much yeah. choice at all. Um, mm. In relation to these increases in corporation tax, I mean, we're all like, oh dear. The Chancellor seemed to herald that this was going to be a temporary change. What's your view of the future of corporation tax and tax rates over a five to ten year view? Well, I think that they can't carry on increasing. I know that the, the country has a huge debt and it needs to settle that debt, uh, which reduces the interest the country pays. But from a business perspective, the more you raise corporate taxes, the less revenue you get. As yeah. a, as a economics bell curve that says if you increase taxes too much you'll get less return. Yes, it's called the Laffer curve. Yeah, um, so people think, well hang on, it's now 25%, I'm going to maximise what I put into my pension, whereas for the last three years I didn't. Yes, uh, there's, I mean that's a proven economic mm. theory. Yeah. Um, was, it, was it Edwin Laffer who did it in the oh. 1980s? I can't remember. I would say 1980s is well before my time but I'd be lying. <laughs> <laughs> no, and yeah. I always, every time, yeah. every time uh, the Chancellor mm. increases rates. I said it's not the Laffer curve as much mm. as the Urabina Laffer curve, yeah. because yeah. They, the, 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 the the economists mm. in the Treasury don't seem to be aware of this existence. That you know, the, the less is more rule, basically, mm. isn't it? The more yeah. you lower rates, the more tax you take in total. Yes, which yes. seems weird, but it's actually true. So, just moving back to the pensions arena, you know, you've you've been many many years in this arena. Not 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 too many. I'm not going to give. But what are the yeah. sort of m biggest mistakes you've seen people make with their pensions? Biggest mistakes? Um, well, apart from being outright scammed, right. which is a massive thing, uh, there was a, well, there, there is still a spate of uh, people being convinced to take out a SAS and being convinced that they ought to bring all their pensions together because someone's got this absolutely amazing investment opportunity for them in Malaysian rubber trees or I've got a friend who's a property developer who you can lend the money to and um, I think the biggest mistake people make is getting all starry eyed and thinking I'm going to be a pensions property millionaire next week, have all my money and then they never see it again. That's that's. Yes, one of the biggest mistakes. It is. It, it is yeah. what rather unfortunate. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I probably see one of these cannot be missed mm. investment opportunities yeah. a month come yeah. across my desk. Yeah. Um, generally from yeah. uh, the Middle East or mm -hmm. the Far East, um, and it, my tendency is to go, "Yep, interesting." Mm -hmm. Thank I you always very much. show it. Well, I always yeah. show them to a friend of mine in London who's a very successful um, international entrepreneur and, and runs a, runs mm -hmm. a capital fund. And if he rings me up and says, send me the information prospectus, then I'm like, I'm, I'm. if he says, yeah. don't touch it, I'm like, that's yeah. it. Yeah. Because he's dialed into what's really going mm. on. You've, when you're talking about speculative investments like that, whether mm. you're doing it personally or in the pension fund, get 
like you bought somebody really, really, really yeah, knows. Yeah, absolutely. Doing. Other mistakes um, tend to revolve around believing what people read um, in things like Facebook forums. Uh, and, and online. I thought you were going to say yeah. the press. Um, <laughs> no, you, a, 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 there's a lot more uh, of people going online through social media mm -hmm. and being told, for example, you can lend all of your pension fund to your buy-to-let business. All you've got to do is have this little piece of paper um, mm. saying that if there's a default, we'll sell the property and just put the cash back into the SAS because that means there's no residential property. So there's lots of um, people believing the hype of what is possible, yes. but not actually getting proper advice. No. We've talked about the economic maelstrom, we've mm. talked about interest rates, we've talked about pensions and corporation tax rates. If somebody came through your door today and said, I'm thinking of starting a business, Paul, what advice would you give them? Mm. <laughs> 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 I'd say br brilliant. It depends what the idea is and it depends on what their business is. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I obviously work with a lot of entrepreneurs who have got amazing scientific ideas about what they want to do or products they're developing and it's a brilliant opportunity for them to sit down and say right okay so what's your team? Who are your other directors going to be? How do you want to structure the business? So the advice would be take time to look at what your business structure is going to be don't just focus on raising money and the product. Yeah, no, I would agree. I think I mean, we see a lot of serial entrepreneurs, uh, and one not a million miles from us, so they mm. have genuinely great ideas. Mm. Um, they build, they start up the business, they, yeah. they get it established, uh, and they have no real conception, or indeed mm. entrepreneurs, no real interest in running a yeah. stable and mature business. For them, it's yeah. the buzz of creativity, yeah. the yeah. excitement of doing things. And having that, I call mm. it, if you can survive beyond three years, there's a mm. very good chance you're going to survive longer term. But mm. having the, okay, what am I gonna do after three years? Because I don't want to end up stuck behind the shop counter, if such a thing exists, or the, mm. the digital shop counter for the rest of my life, because I want to go and do other exciting things, have a follow through plan, have some, yeah take some advice about at least operational matters. Mm. It's not all about the idea and it's certainly not all about the tax. Um, but yeah, I mean, I talk to young entrepreneurs and, and, and budding mm. entrepreneurs on a regular basis. And the one thing I say to them, I say, look, you do realize this is not all gonna be wine, roses and excitement and edge of the, you know, seat of the pants, adrenaline rush. Yeah. At some stage it's going to become boring and you've got to be ready for that. If you're not willing to accept boring, you've got to be ready to employ staff or, or sell mm -hmm. sell it to somebody for whom boring is actually cool. Um, and there are people yeah. out there, yeah. but yeah, it's fascinating. Mm. You got anything else you, the discussion has, you know, let's talk yes, about? I think the, the key thing, particularly when it comes to pensions, is to talk to someone who knows what you can do with the structure you're talking about. I, mean, I, I get phone calls on a daily basis, people saying, oh, I, I, I've been told I should have a, a SAS. And I say to them, so what is it that your business does? And they go, oh, I don't have a business. I'm, I'm currently employed by so-and-so, so-and-so. Um, <laughs> so there's a lot of people out there who become fixated on you must have something. Mm -hmm. But what they don't do is actually wind the clock back and say, is it appropriate? Is it right for me to do this do yeah. I need to talk to someone um, first and, and foremost yeah you need a pension yeah then yeah what that pension is or indeed yeah. could be well yeah. as you rightly say depending yeah. on your employment status and yeah. there's nothing yeah. to stop you transitioning and then by oh, the way do a lot of that you do can a lot transition of that. from yeah. employer pension to SIP you can sit to SAS yes depending yes. on who you are yeah. and what your yeah. stage of business life and your business structures are yeah I mean, I've, I've turned I said turned away I've advised so off the record, a number of people <coughs> to say, go, go and um, carry on doing what you're doing and put as much money as you can afford away into something like a SIP because they're cheap and cheerful and you, you, know, you can build up a fund. If you want to be a property entrepreneur in your pension, the key is having enough money to actually physically buy a property. Yes, I mean, so, again, because there is a borrowing limit inside pension, yeah. which I don't think we quite no, mentioned. We, did, we didn't mention that. You, you can borrow 50% of the, the value that's inside the SAS. So if you've got 100,000 in your SAS, you can borrow another 50. Right. And does the same limit apply to SIPs? Yes. So, 
Yeah, so any any pension, any, any recognised pension, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's no point having this big, expensive um, occupational pension scheme sat there whilst you're putting a thousand pounds a month into it. You might as well start with the SIP. Yeah. Look, look at your strategy. There's no point, like I say, many times having a Ferrari on the drive and not being able to afford the insurance. No, indeed. Well, these mm. days, the petrol. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very true. Well, listen, Paul, yeah. thank you so much for coming in to talk My to pleasure, me. David. Uh, pleasure. As always, we've included links to both Cornerstone, SDLT refunds, and indeed to Paul's business, so that you can follow through if you want to do some research, ask Paul some questions direct, and indeed ask us some questions. I've been David Hanna for Cornerstone Tax SDLT Refunds. Thank you for listening to Coffee and Property.